Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Ellig, the CEO and founder of Ella Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm delighted to welcome Jenna Drosos, Chief Executive Officer and Board Director of Signet Jewelers, the world's largest retailer of diamond jewelry. Jenna was appointed CEO in 2017 and has served as a director of Signet's board since 2012. Prior to Signet, Jenna served as CEO of Assurex Health and experienced executive Jenna spent 25 years at Procter & Gamble, where her last position was Group President, Global Beauty Care. With over 30 years of executive leadership experience in the consumer goods, personal care, and healthcare industry, she was at the forefront of mass market e-commerce global retail, reinventing product categories and turning around global billion dollar brands. Among many other accomplishments, she has been recognized as one of Fortune's 50 most powerful women in business and has a long history of supporting purpose-driven organizations through her commitment to board leadership. Jenna, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you for your decades of leadership. You have been paving the way and standing up and speaking out for gender parity, taking action. It's just a pleasure. I've long admired all that you've done for women in C-suite and board roles. So thank you for having me. Well, and you're paving the way for many women to follow you and your lead. You know, I've really been looking at Signet, not just its wonderful rising stock price and earnings, but your website, which is so empowering and so inspirational. And your mission is one that is really something that I admire, which is enabling all people to celebrate life and express love. What a wonderful message. What a wonderful mission. So I have to ask you, as the world's largest retailer of diamond jewelry and the largest specialty jewelry retailer in the U.S., the U.K., and Canada, how are you bringing that mission to life and impacting so many around the world? Well, our mission and our purpose are something that Signet team members hold very dear. I mean, we have the wonderful opportunity and privilege really to be part of so many of people's meaningful life moments. There's not a time that I don't go out into our stores and hear a story of one of our jewelry consultants being invited to a wedding because they've become so close to the couple that they were helping to find the perfect engagement ring. I think what's been become even more important to us over time is the idea of helping all people celebrate life and express love. Most people know us by our banner names, K Jewelers, the number one jeweler in America, Zales, Jared, Piercing Pagoda, uh, and JamesAllen.com in the U.S. We also have People's Jewelers, which is number one in Canada, and H. Samuel and Ernest Jones in the U.K. And what all of these banners have in common is that we have both a physical retail footprint of about 2,500 stores, as well as an ever-growing digital footprint and opportunity to interact with customers online. We're really there to bring our mission to life and to help serve them wherever whenever, and however they want to shop. Yes, and your brands really appeal to so many different price levels and people that can afford jewelry and really celebrate other people's lives by giving that gift, right? Whether it be for a wedding or an anniversary or just to make somebody feel good. So the price points are really quite wide, are they not? It's true. The jewelry category in the markets in which we operate is about a $90 billion category. We play in what we would define as the mid-market tier of that category, which is a little bit more than half. But we have a wide variety of price points within those price tiers. It's really our aim to prioritize accessibility so that we are helping all people to celebrate life and express love. And we do that through high quality jewelry that is also a great value for our customers, as well as through offering a variety of financing programs. You know, sometimes a young couple buying an engagement ring it might be the most expensive purchase they've ever had. And so we want to to make that as accessible and easy for them as we can. I've listened to you on network TV uh, speaking about the performance of Signet Jewelers, which is really, with robust profits, really amazing. Uh, And as of June 28th of this year, your shares have risen 185% and the past 12 months, 450%. This is incredible. Uh, I wish I had purchased your shares back <laughs> over a year ago. And I understand 
you really have been on a three-year transformation. So what has been that strategic focus to take the stock to where it has soared today? We started our transformation of Signet about three years ago, a little more. That's how long I've been the CEO and really partnered with our employees across Signet in our stores, in our strategy team, our finance team, all functions to really try to diagnose what it would take to be not just the leading jewelry retailer, because we're the biggest, but to actually lead growth and innovation in the category. And what we found was that our assortment was not as modern as it needed to be, certainly not as appealing and modern as it is today. We were too reliant on old marketing models, very heavy TV, holiday-focused marketing. And we hadn't yet embraced e-commerce as a place that customers would want to shop for jewelry. Honestly, there was a paradigm that said that jewelry is too expensive or too personal. You have to touch and feel it. So we set off to put a strategy in place that could really help us grow and actually debunk some of those myths. It started with customer first as a key strategy. That was really all about understanding our customers better, uh, differentiating Appreciating our different banners. At the time, Kay and Zales and Jared were selling a lot of the same merchandise and overlapping each other, and we've teased that apart. So we're now appealing to different customer groups. It was about creating more distinctive and helpful and interesting content, no matter what part of the journey a customer is on, and changing our marketing models to be always on, to be year-round. People don't just think about getting engaged in November. I mean, they're thinking about that in March and May and you know today. And so we wanted to make sure that we were there to answer their questions and make sure that we were top of mind. So that, that was kind of the first strategy, customer first. The second was omni-channel. That was really, you know, about getting into e-commerce. We rebuilt our web platforms, went from technology that was quite literally as old as the internet um, to, you know, very modern technology so that we could improve on that. We put a chief digital officer in place. We've built agile teams. So we now have teams of people who, you know, live, eat, and breathe making search and browse or checkout on our websites a wonderful experience we had a new technology like virtual try-on. You can upload a photo of your hand and try on rings virtually. So really just making that experience great. Our third strategic plank was to evolve our culture into one that was much more innovative and agile, you know, that was willing to try new things and that could fund those experiences by driving out every cost that customers didn't see or care about. Because we had already been working on putting that transformation in place, when COVID hit, we were two years in uh, and we were able to pivot very quickly into being a purely digital company for some period of time. Within 48 hours, we empowered our store managers to be able to serve our customers from their homes using their iPads. Within six months, we had more than 700 virtual jewelry consultants serving people online. We added chat function and capability. We did curbside pickup, same day concierge delivery, so a number of different flexible fulfillment options. And it's really because we were we were already well on that path that we were able to pivot so quickly. And, and that's really the momentum that we saw in the back half of last year and that carried through to a great first quarter. So I'm, I'm very proud of the team. It's not easy to adopt new capabilities like that so quickly. But I believe that they're so relentlessly focused on wanting to serve our customers uh, in the best possible ways that they embraced all of those new skills and capabilities much faster than you could you know, even imagine. That's an incredible story. You were thinking ahead. You had strategies in place, but you didn't expect a pandemic, right? What trends are you seeing now in customer behavior? So we say post-pandemic uh, world. What are you seeing today? Because your earnings for this first quarter of 2021 jumped nearly 14%. So you're obviously meeting those trends from having been prepared before. But what are you seeing that you need to do even more of to keep that momentum for your stock and earnings? It's a great question. And one that, you know, I think is, uh, is both heartwarming and maybe also pragmatic. One of the things that we saw during the pandemic is that when people were not able to be out with 
you know, the masses were not able to be at a party or see, you know, everyone within their friend network, they really focused on those who are most important to them. One of our customers had a quote that I, I always remember. He said, one of the great gifts of COVID is clarity. I mean, it really, you know, allowed people to think about who are those most meaningful people in our lives and how do we celebrate them? Because every day is important. So we've really seen a trend toward people celebrating each other with jewelry. It's, you know, a gift of love. It's imbued with meaning. It's a lasting gift. You know, every woman that you meet can, you know, point to the jewelry that she's wearing and tell you, when she got it and what it means to her, uh, because it, it always has a story with it. And so we saw that really happen during COVID. And, and it was a trend that started last summer. We predicted it early. And so we were ready at holiday to, you know, with merchandise that was uh, at a variety of price points to, to help people be able to purchase a meaningful gift. We saw that come through Valentine's Day. Usually Valentine's Day is a lower priced purchase occasion, often new relationships, you know, wanting to declare that, yes, we're dating, you know, therefore we're celebrating Valentine's Day together. But this year was different. Our average transaction value was roughly double what it was last year or the year before pre-pandemic because we saw many more husbands buying meaningful gifts for oh, their wives wonderful. to celebrate, you know, all that they'd been through together. So so, so that that's one trend that I hope is enduring is that we celebrate those who are closest to us um, with gifts of meaning. A couple of others that we've seen that I, I think are really interesting would be the power of jewelry as a statement piece, self-expression. We call it Zoom-worthy jewelry. You know, you can't see what great shoes people are wearing or if they have a nice bag when they're on the Zoom screen, but you can certainly see their earrings and pendants. And so we've seen that. And I think as companies come back into a work environment that, you know, in many cases is a hybrid work environment. We'll continue to see jewelry as a, a powerful accessory in that context. A third one, you know, I've talked a little bit about connected commerce, but if I just say specifically in the jewelry category, people are searching and browsing more online and they're coming into stores with a better idea what they're looking for. It's not like they're walking into stores with a white sheet of paper like they were before. They've already thought it through and, and that's giving us a much higher closure rate, actually, as our expert consultants are able to provide them with information. You have other pieces of the business besides, you know, the retail sale. I understand you also buy used jewelry. Uh, and certainly there are times when people have jewelry they've inherited or whatever that maybe they want to sell. So is that one or piece of the business that we don't know about? And are there other parts of the business that we should know about? That's part of our services strategy, Janice. You know, if you think about your life and your relationship with jewelry, it's episodes of purchase occasions. You know, it could be self-purchase. Uh, you got promoted and isn't that exciting? You know, or it could be romantic gifts or it could be a Mother's Day or a Valentine's Day gift. We're seeing women and men, for example, purchase more spontaneously uh, these days than we ever have before. For, which I think is also a, a you know a great trend to see people celebrating themselves, especially coming out of COVID. But but one of the things that can link together those episodes, if you will, of jewelry purchases or services, worry-free wear. You know, how do you take care of your pieces? What what if it goes out of style and you you know you or it just doesn't meet your style anymore? You don't like it anymore. How can you recraft it? And we have had for a while now the largest care and repair business of all jewelers in the US. We have 1400 master craftsmen and artisans who are part of Signet and every day they size people's jewelry and you know, polish it and fix the prongs and, you know, everything that you can imagine. But it's only recently that we've started talking to people about the custom creation kind of opportunity. We now have 50 Jared stores that have a foundry. Uh, they have CAD CAM software, a 3D printer. You can, you know, you could go in and take, you know, your mom's jewelry box that you've inherited and say, wow, this, this is all sentimental to me. You know, I'd love to do something with it, but it's not my style. And we can help you create a brand new piece using those metals and stones. And it's a wonderful thing, especially for Gen Z. They're a very 
sustainability-minded generation. It's one of the reasons why we bought Roxbox to become part of the circular economy with rental as an option. It's also a way to meet some, you know younger women pre-engagement as they're you know just beginning to get a professional experience maybe with jewelry as they're out in the career world and looking for more jewelry. So we think this whole circular economy of previously owned treasures, you know, being able to recycle jewelry, being able to recreate jewelry that maybe you have and has meaning, but you want something new, or being able to buy diamonds that were previously owned for an engagement ring. All of those we think are a growing trend, especially with the new generation. And it's an area where we already have a presence, but we believe we can grow that substantially. Well, you're certainly listening to the customer voice and the customer journey of many uh, multiple generations here. So you're meeting those needs. Let's go back to a bit of your career, having after graduating from University of Georgia in Wharton, you, your first internship was at Procter & Gamble. And, and then 25 years later, you leave as their group president, Global Beauty Care. Tell us about that impact of that experience and how you are using that today at Signet. Well, you're absolutely right. I was an intern at P&G between my two years of uh, getting my MBA at the Wharton School. And I had a wonderful experience. I was really influenced actually to go to business school uh, because of an experience I had in college. I was always going to law school. Uh, my father was an attorney and he just had great affection for his career. I thought he made a real difference in the world. And so I thought I would go that direction. But I, in my junior year, I couldn't afford to go on a very exciting spring break vacation. And so I did an entrepreneurial venture. My roommate and I chartered sailboats in the Bahamas and recruited eight boats full of people to go such that we could go for free. And on the front of a sailboat in the Bahamas, I thought, you know, I like this business thing. <laughs> I think this <laughs> this could be for me. And so I, uh, when I came back my senior year, I didn't apply to law schools. I applied to business schools. And uh, that's how I ended up at Wharton, which was a fantastic experience. So I liked that idea of running a business. And when I got to P&G, I found that that's what you were given the authority to do at a really young tenure. Uh, I started managing a P&L three years into my career there. And as I grew to increasing responsibility, I was getting a more and more holistic view of how to run a company, you know, smaller sizes growing to bigger sizes. And I also um, was part of what I would say was an entrepreneurial part of P&G. I, I started in, you know, working in the beauty care area. Um, and P&G at the time was largely a soap and diaper company. But I was part of a team that over a number of years grew P&G's beauty business to be number one in the world, in the middle of this soap and diaper company, and using a lot of the company's core capabilities, capabilities in branding, in distribution, in R&D, but applying those to the beauty industry in a way that was breakthrough. Um, I could give you two examples that you know I think of fondly. One is... At a very early tenure, I launched the first body washes into the U.S. market. Um, it's hard, you know, my kids don't even remember this, uh, but, you know, but, but uh, the U.S. used to be an exclusively bar soap market, really. I mean, we didn't use liquid soaps in the shower, but that was uh, a huge trend globally. And P&G had a great hair care business. And so I worked with my marketing, you know, research and my product development colleagues. And we came up with a concept to launch an Olay two-in-one moisturizing body wash. And it was a huge success. Uh, it almost doubled the size of our business in the U.S. at the time. And so then they put me in charge of the total Olay business. Uh, and I put together a billion dollar vision for Olay uh, and uh, ultimately came to higher and higher levels of leadership, but was ultimately able to grow the Olay brand from about $200 million in sales when I started to over two and a half billion dollars when I left. Um, and so we did that, you know, through innovation, through understanding customers, R&D, Etc. But it was a really great formative experience for me, both in the world of general management 
in the world of teamwork and collaboration. I, I had a lot of opportunity to work with and for powerful women. And so I saw the power of a diverse team. I had a very international job and I worked hard to build an, a very diverse team. And, and that was a real cornerstone of our success. Uh, and so it, that, those are all lessons that I took next into my entre entrepreneurial venture when I ran a startup company uh, in the genetic space. And then I brought to Signet after that. You know, you've been reinventing product categories and turning around billion dollar brands for a long time here. So this is, and you're bringing this all to Signet. It's really an incredible story. I just want to remind our audience that we are speaking to Jenna Drosos. So the topics we cover like today's are all current and a new topic with a new game changer is released on the third Thursday of every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. And now let's return to to Jenna to talk more about Signet Jewelers and the brands that she is building and the soaring stock price that she has achieved. It's really incredible. Also, what's incredible, Jenna, is that you have gender parity. And being in the search business, I'm really concerned about companies not having representation of women and underrepresented groups at all levels. You have gender parity on your leadership team, on your board of directors. And I understand 75% of your store assistant managers and above are women. How did this all happen? Because I'd love every company and CEO to follow this lead. And how does it translate into really serving your customers and driving business? Well, it's something that we're very proud of, Janice, and I think is a key contributor to the results that we're seeing, not just gender parity, but our entire approach to diversity as a business strategy. I think in some companies, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, at least historically, was treated more as an HR mandate. Um, it wasn't necessarily tracked like business goals are tracked. Uh, and, and it wasn't something that leaders were held accountable for, just like they're held accountable for market share growth or profit growth. Um, but at Signet, we, we think about it very much as a business strategy and, and very much as something that we track as a business result. Uh, when I came onto Signet's board, I was only the second woman ever uh, to serve on our board of directors. That was in 2013. And under our chairman, Todd Stitzer's leadership, he's built a highly diverse board. 58% uh, of our board directors are either women or persons of color. And that just produces such an innovative spirit in the boardroom. The kinds of dialogue that we have, how the board helps me see around the corner is um, really unlike anything I've been part of before. So a lot of credit to, you know, to Todd and the other directors for creating I think from the very top of our company, that kind of inclusivity. And then, of course, um, for me on my leadership team, I have achieved gender parity at our vice president and above. We have leading racial and gender diversity, which I feel very proud of. And then, as you said, 75% of our store managers are women. And so we, we really believe all of those things help us um, be more agile. They help us be more innovative, and they help us serve our, our customers uh, in the jewelry category more effectively. Um, I, I see it as a competitive advantage for us. So it's something that we, we continue to think about. We just have launched recently a new employee experience. It's all about training and development for our uh, very talented team. We have a path to $15 base wage in our workforce. Of course, you know, in our sales organization, our jewelry consultants have a commission on top of that. So we're really wanting this to be, um, you know, something that uh, that can be very powerful for them. We just have granted our field teams um, two hours a month to be fully dedicated to training and new skill areas. And we have record numbers of our team becoming certified diamondologists um, who are really more and more every day capable to serve our customers in the store or by connecting online to you know, our vast array of inventory that we have across the country. So you had been the first female CEO at Signet. 
right? So what advice would you give to other women leaders to help their team thrive? And also just about their own development, you know, what's key for a woman today to rise up to be CEO and then how to develop other women leaders? I mean, I think sometimes we we think that it, one can do it. Well, you can't do it just one alone. You know, you really need the help of others and standing on the shoulders of others. So what's the advice you give to those women leaders? I, I think actually the, my answer to those two questions um, would be merged into one. I think, and, and this is advice that I give to male leaders on my team as well, but I think that the the key role of a leader is to set a clear and inspiring vision for the team, to be clear about what the priorities are and the key strategies, and then to create an environment where everyone feels like they can bring their full selves to work and thrive. So breaking down barriers when they get in the way. Um, it's it's really it's really about being humble to know that you can't do it yourself, and that uh, the efforts and achievements of a team are always better than those of an individual when you're all rowing in the same direction. Um, so so the advice that I give is when you're early in your career, don't be focused on promotion timing. Be focused on acquiring diverse experiences work in a different function. If you're in the finance organization, ask to work for a few months in the marketing organization. Ask for, if you work in retail, ask to work in the field. When I was um, growing up in the marketing organization at at P&G, I had the great opportunity to spend three months working as a sales rep, stocking shelves, calling on grocery store managers, um, you know, understanding how to build a display. I mean, these were things that really helped me later on. I also, when I was running the global cosmetics business, took the opportunity to go to a Boots cosmetics counter uh, in the UK, just outside of London. I, I spent a week as a makeup artist at a Max Factor counter that we had at Boots. Now, I, I'm not saying I didn't get help, Janice. I'm not sure you wanted me, <laughs> you know, being your uh, forever makeup artist, but I learned so much throwing myself into that kind of a different experience. And so that's what I always say to young leaders is don't be focused on how fast you can move up. Be focused on how well-rounded your learning is, because that's ultimately what will give you the perspective to make better decisions and to be a better leader of people across functions that you don't understand very well. The other kind of I guess, second portion of that is ask a lot of questions. Don't, don't ever, you know, feel uncomfortable asking questions. I, um, I remember early in my career as a brand manager, making a deal with my finance partner that we would go to lunch, uh, every quarter and we would talk about what was important in our functions. And I, I taught him how to evaluate good advertising and I taught him how to think about a digital marketing budget and, uh, and you know, how to think about customer needs and how you translate that into a product development strategy. And he taught me more than I ever learned, uh, in business school or before that as a finance major about corporate finance and what was important to look at on a, you know, P&L and how to think about cash management. And all of those learnings have served me so incredibly well because we were willing to ask each other questions. It seems like one of the things you're saying to um, any, you know, aspiring leader is get out of your comfort zone, right? Uh, Play in a lot of different areas so that you will learn and be really well-rounded as an all around great athlete and ask those questions, right? Because that's the only way we'll learn. You know, you, you noted earlier something that I do think is characteristic within my career is that I love a good turnaround. I Mm -hmm. love to work (laughs) on a transformation of a business. I, I love to grow a business from, you know, small to being much bigger. Um, that's, that's the kind of challenge that I really embrace. I I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't had a variety of different kinds of roles early on. I mean, it's 
that that's where you learn what you're good at and and what you like to do. And a lot of times those two things go hand in hand. Well, you are a role model for many uh, out there listening today. Uh, you've had a longstanding commitment to supporting purpose-driven organizations. You donate your time and commitment to board leadership. And how do you want your legacy uh, to be remembered? What's, you know, in terms of your success, making the world a better place, what what's next for you and what do you want to do well it's very interesting i mean i think i think that my um my personal mission um has now kind of come you know full circle and is some ways integrated with signet's um personal mission i've i've always thought that inspiring love in the world was um, was so important. It just it unlocks all kinds of power of transformation in people's lives. And whatever my sphere of influence has been, I've wanted to make the world that I could touch, you know, a, a better place. And so I've done that as, you know, I train and develop people to have the kind of career that they'd like to and realize their dreams for themselves and their family. I hope I've done that through board leadership. I serve on the board of Akron Children's Hospital, which is a hospital that is doing great research and really saving the lives of children in so many ways. Um, We, as a company, donate to St. Jude, which has been a pioneer in life-changing therapies around the world and, and just such a great organization to be part of. Um, so, so I think that, you know, we can all like make a difference using our skill sets. Um, one, one other piece of advice that I often give, especially mothers, you know, who are working moms like me, um, you know, juggling, uh, you know, juggling a lot of things as I did through much of my career is, uh, is to find the ways to contribute that, um, that are, are visible to your family. I, I say go for two first. You know, don't don't be the mom who, you know, volunteers for the fundraising that your children never see. Instead, volunteer to go on the field trip, or volunteer to bring the dinner for the basketball team. You know, before the before the big tournament game or whatever that is, so that you can find those ways to give back that also help you to um, to achieve other things that are in your lives. I think when you integrate your life that way, it makes it much easier to have a sustainable impact. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's how we all create change is um, by wanting to be the change that we want to be in the world. And I, I think at Signet, we're doing that through our purpose of inspiring love. I feel great about that. I feel great that we're standing up for causes that we believe in. In the last year, we certainly have spoken out against racial injustice. And within our own four walls, we've had very honest and authentic conversations about race and about things that we can do better and about learning more and more about each other. And that kind of continual growth and learning and just making Signet a more diverse and inclusive place Um, It spreads, I think, Janice. I mean, with 26,000 employees, if every one of them goes home to dinner and talks about, you know, some of the great things that we're doing um, and that they're doing at work every day, it it spreads to, you know, to their families and to their communities and to the next generation. You know, you bring up such an important point because when your children, your family um, sort of participate in how you're giving back either through your company or, you know, like you sitting uh, on a hospital board and giving back that way. It, it, you know, statistics show that then those children grow up and they give back. You know, because right. they saw their parent or their aunt or wh- whomever giving. And it's so important to impact your family that way because then they want, want to give back because it's really a privilege to be able to give, isn't it? Yes, but they also help you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see. Mm-hmm, right. I, I remember a particular Mother's Day when my children asked me what I wanted for Mother's Day. And I said, let's go do something meaningful together. And so we decided to go to a a woman's shelter for uh, abused and battered women. And I had the address and I, you know, was trying to find it and, and I couldn't find it. And I kept making a wrong turn. And finally, in frustration, I said, oh, I can't find this place. Why is it so hard to find? And my eight-year-old daughter piped up from the back seat and said, 
well, mom, maybe they need to make it hard to find to protect these women. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I thought, wow, wow. I mean, even today, I could almost break into tears just over, you know, the the insight, the, the innocence and the insight of that moment. Yes. And we had the, a joy of an afternoon making crafts with kids for their moms who who needed to feel that love more than any other mom I can imagine. And, you know, what what a treasured experience. But yes, I think when you can participate with your children, it it not only does something good for them and how they think about, you know, the lives ahead of them, but it does something really special for you as well. That's a great story. Jenna, any parting words for our audience? I think, I mean, probably the power of team, Janice. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm so proud of how our Signet team has pivoted over the last year, embraced new capabilities. I think that's what leadership is all about, is it's, you know, about being able to, um, to reimagine experiences for customers, to be able to transform brands, to be modern again. Uh, I remember when I started working on Oil of Olay, you know, it was disaffectionately called Oil of Old Lady, you know, by people in focus (laughs) groups. And yet we took that, that brand with the breakthrough technology that we put on it to be the number one brand, not only in the U.S., but also in China and in the U.K. and in many countries of the world, a very modern, you know, leading skincare brand. So this this idea of always being willing to to obsolete yourself and reinvent yourself to appeal to customers, I think is a lesson that people in all, all different kinds of businesses can reapply. Uh, and it makes it a lot more fun as well. It's more more fun to lead change than to be um, to ever be the victim of change. And it's certainly much more rewarding for um, your employees and your shareholders. Gina, thank you again for joining us today as the CEO of Signet Jewelers, the largest retailer of diamond jewelry. Your story is really inspirational. And you really have turned around so many brands prior and now at Signet. You are an inspiration to the people that you lead at Signet and your board, and to other women aspiring to be CEOs of companies. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined, released on the third Thursday of each month. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. And again, to Jenna Drosso, CEO of Signet Jewelers, thank you for your story. Thank you so much, Janice. The best is yet to come. And we'll be watching.